uh, blackboard that Einstein wrote on. As you can see it at Oxford, actually. It's a photo of a, they, they kept a blackboard that Einstein wrote on at Oxford. It's pretty cool if you're in England, go check it out. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I'm Brian Lewis. Uh, I've been here before. I recognize many of you. Thanks for coming. Um, so this is a, a, we'll go quickly through, boy, that's terrible. I need to buy you guys a new projector. Um, so, uh, yeah, this is a, <clears throat> it was a little bit misadvertised <laughs> in the meetup. I'm actually uh, speaking in opposition of distributed computing <laughs> instead of about distributed computing. So let me, yeah, let me explain that. So um, this is a talk I gave at the Interface Conference a couple weeks ago. Uh, 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 the author of Spark R was at the conference, and uh, he was giving a tutorial on Spark R on the day that the R integration with Spark was announced. So Spark 1.4 now includes R as a first class language along with Scala and uh, Python. So if you don't know what Spark is, Spark is a distributed computing framework uh, written in Scala that's kind of, you know, builds, goes beyond what you can do with Hadoop quite significantly. And um, so, you know, I went to that conference with the intention of um, dissuading people from using large-scale distributed systems, and instead thinking about solving their problems first before trying to deploy them on some distributed implementation. And I, I think I'm, I have license to do that because in my day job I work on large-scale distributed computation uh, pretty exclusively. Um, uh, with Mike Stonebreaker and others up, up in Boston. Um, and um, I see the pitfalls of, of doing this often, and people jump to use these systems when they don't have to. Sometimes you have to, but often they're used frivolously, and they just just kind of um, get in your way. So the, that text there says, think about solving your problems before trying to implement them. That's true generally. You should just think carefully before you type on a computer screen about your problem, like how, how might you go solving it. And then this is really especially true when a distributed system is thrown in the mix, like Hadoop or Spark or whatever. Um, and then the thing that I think most people don't realize um, is that sometimes like really seemingly large problems uh, are actually very small in some sense um, and can be solved efficiently. And people don't, don't understand that. Um, so I, I think some... No, here's a great quote. At the conference, a friend of mine, Bill Cleveland, was giving a really interesting talk about Tessera, a large-scale distributed project that he's working on at Purdue. Uh, and um, I love this. He actually said this in his talk, so I made a slide on it, that big data is a nonsense term. That's Bill Cleveland. Um, uh, Bill Cleveland's kind of a famous statistician, many of you may know. Um, and. Uh, I'm going to show you an example from a, I'm a big fan of this guy named Frank McSherry, um, uh, who used to work at Microsoft Research, and now I think he's at some secretive startup. I'm not sure exactly where. Well, I, I know exactly where, but I'm not sure exactly what he's working on now. But until recently, he worked for Microsoft Research. And this quote, it's hard to read. Um, he was looking at Hadoop and Spark and Giraffe and a bunch of graph. Uh, large-scale distributed graph computation engines. And he, he wrote a paper uh, in January, uh, and in that paper he says, our conclusion is not that the systems we were looking at are obviously bad, but that rather that there's not much any evidence that they're any good. And I agree uh, strongly with him. And here's a, uh, oh, wow, that's unreadable, shucks. What can I do to improve the, the picture? Did you get cable loose or something? Because we usually don't have the thing turned pink on. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, let me try. Wow, that's pretty bad. Um, Do you have uh, Flux installed? Sorry? Do you have this software called Flux installed? Flux, I don't know what that is. Oh, it's a... Uh, it changes color and temperature of your thermometer. Maybe. 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 Yeah. Uh, shucks. Uh, yeah, so, okay, I can read you these numbers. It's not that important. Um, so Frank, Frank McSherry was uh, looking at a paper published by the Spark guys um, at Berkeley in November where they were comparing, um, so there's a graph engine built on top of Spark called GraphX that some of you may know. When I say graph, I mean, you know, 
network analysis problems like Facebook or uh, there are some fraud detection problems and uh, terrorist detection you know on communication networks these are very important problems that you know we see all the time um, and because they're so important there's a ton of different technologies out there for trying to solve those problems um, there was a large-scale distributed system called Accumulo, written by the NSA originally, and now part of Apache. Uh, there's a thing called GraphLab, which is a commercial distributed graph computing engine. There's a thing called GraphX, which is a component that sits above Spark and does graph computations on big clusters. And then uh, he also tested Giraffe, which is another Apache project. In fact, these are all Apache projects. Uh, Giraffe is another large-scale distributed graph engine for uh, like finding communities and networks and things like that. And so he's, he, the paper, he was mimicking, Frank was mimicking um, problems that were done in this paper by the Spark guys. And there were two problems. Uh, PageRank, which is, was, made, well, was famously coined by the Google, uh, uh, Bryn and um, Page, um, uh, when Google started. It's actually a much older algorithm that they kind of uh, uh, you know, put into the place for the web. Uh, so page rank basically is an eigenvector problem in linear algebra. It just tries to find an important thing. That basically in graphs, it finds nodes in the graph that have a lot of connections. That's what page rank does. Um, the other thing was a community detection graph, which is a graph partitioning algorithm that tries to partition a graph into some semi-separate subgraphs that are not, that are independently very connected, but separately are not that well connected, right? That's a community detection problem. And there were two algorithms that they used. And in the, in the uh, paper written by the guys at Berkeley, they tested this stuff on a small cluster that had 128 CPU cores. So that's probably like eight computers in a network, not a very large cluster. Um, but 128 CPU cores and a terabyte of, aggregate, of RAM in aggregate. And McSherry looked at that and was like, you know, these problems aren't that big. I could probably run them on my MacBook. I wonder how fast they would run. And, that, and doing that, that turned into a paper for him uh, because uh, he outperformed the performance of these large-scale graph systems on his MacBook. Um, he achieved parity with them without even thinking about it, with just doing a naive implementation of both algorithms. And then he thought a little bit about how to optimize those two algorithms, PageRank and uh, the community detection algorithm. Uh, to take it, you know, to, to work better on a limited mem constrained memory system, a 16 gigabyte MacBook Pro. And so, um, so Spark took 419 seconds to run 20 iterations, uh, 20 iterations of PageRank for Twitter's example data set, uh, which anybody can download. It's a portion of the Twitter graph. It only has uh, a billion and a half edges. It's a very small subset of Twitter, 41 million vertices. Um, so all of Twitter is 300 million vertices, and I don't know how many edges. Um, so uh, GraphX and Spark took 419 seconds on the big cluster with 128 cores, and Frank McSherry's MacBook Pro took 100 seconds to do the same thing with one core. He didn't have a parallel algorithm, it was sequential. <laughs> so uh, this is what I mean by thinking about solving a problem before using a distributed system. So I'll give you some examples um, from my own life. Um, Years ago, I was approached by Novartis, the, drug com the Swiss drug company that have a big campus in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And we were talking about algorithms that were important to them. And one of them is a type of clustering algorithm called bi-clustering. This is for genomics problems. And bi-clustering is very simple. You define what it means for two rows of a matrix to be different, you know, some measurement of difference. And the same thing for columns of a matrix. And then all bi-clustering does is it puts, it, it permutes the rows and columns of a matrix to put similar rows together and similar columns together. That's what it does. And they were very keen on a package written by some folks down at North Carolina State University. Um, these guys, uh, Marin, Lee, Shen, Wang. Um, and there's a really, really nice uh, R package for this algorithm called, uh, so, so the, there's a, there's a, really beautiful set of R packages for bi-clustering in R written by Kurt Hornick and others called BiClust. Uh, and then this is a module that, that uses BiClust called S4VD. It's a faithful implementation of that algorithm. Um, the problem was, at Novartis, it ran really slow. 
So they were like, we'd love to do this for, with genomic data, but we need to parallelize it. So, and they were trying to run it on this giant cluster. Uh, and I'm thinking, wait a minute, let's, let's read the paper and look at the algorithm. And it turns out that there were some obvious optimizations that could be made to this algorithm uh, just by thinking a little bit about what we were trying to compute uh, rather than first thinking about how to implement it on a cluster. And by just making some very small changes to this algorithm that didn't change what we were computing, by the way. We were computing exactly the same thing. We were just computing it differently. We took a problem that took, that was roughly cubic in the number of rows of the matrix uh, down to a problem that was about linear in the number of rows. And that's a big change in compute time if you have um, a lot of rows. So in particular, uh, here's an example of just a, a 1,000 by 10,000 example matrix that we use, use this bi-clustering algorithm on, again, on a MacBook Pro. And with the original package downloaded from CRAN and unmodified, it took 3,522 seconds to do the bi-clustering um, using this code. Um, and computing exactly the same thing with the reformulated routines took 20 seconds on the MacBook Pro, right? And this is a tiny problem, so you can imagine how slow it was for the larger genomics problems that Novartis was interested in. So I'm, I'm in touch with the authors of that paper and the author of the package that's on CRAN, and they're modifying the package to include these optimizations as we speak. It will appear on CRAN soon. But another example of just thinking a little bit about what you're trying to solve uh, before trying to solve it in parallel. Um, so uh, another thing, another example, I'll go kind of quickly through these. Uh, another cute example that I worked on a while back, uh, you know, the last time I talked here, the, the, the plots came out fine. I don't understand. Sorry about the, the uh, display. So um, this is a subset, a subgraph of the Bitcoin transaction network. Uh, I've got a source at the end that, and I'll put these slides on the web. Um, where you can download the, these data. So uh, this is actually stale Bitcoin data. It's like more than a year old. But some, somebody, some guy in Illinois, in University of Illinois, has this really cool web page where he's got all of these Bitcoin transactions uh, recorded. Um, and so here's, a, here's just a tiny, the top 100 by 100 subgraph of that, or 1,000 by 1,000 subgraph of the, uh, so this is a, one of the HTML widgets, by the way, that I talked about last time can't really see it, sorry. Um, but you can view graphs as uh, adjacency matrices, as sparse matrices in R using the sparse matrix package. And, and then, so here's the same thing that I was visualizing as a network, as, a, as a, an adjacency matrix. This is a directed matrix, so it's not symmetric. It means, so a, a dot here means that that column and the vertex at that row are connected, and uh, um, so on. Um, and um, so it's easy to see when you have an adjacency matrix that if you take powers of the matrix, a to, that says a to the k, and then look at the one entry in the matrix, that counts the number of paths that are of length k between those two entries, the row and column, right? So if you have a squared and you look at column three and row five, that tells you how many paths exist between vertex three and five of length two. And if you have a to the fifth, it tells you how many paths of length five between those two points. And that's true for all the points. It's very easy to see that. It's a common thing that's used for counting distances or path distances in networks. Um, and if you add up all of those sums out to infinity, if you form an infinite series of powers of a matrix, um, then the entries of that matrix count the number of paths of all lengths between those two positions at every row and column of the matrix. Now that sum uh, will not converge, it will diverge, uh, because some paths will have an infinite number of uh, lengths between them if you sum this out to infinity. So what people do is they weight the entries of the matrix a little bit, saying, basically they say, well, maybe, maybe super long paths, like a, a path length of 100 is less important than a path length of two, for example. Because if, it, if there's only a length of, of two from one node to another, that means they're pretty they're really close to each other in some sense in the network. But if the path length is 100 between those two, well, you've got to go a long way through the network before they're connected. And so maybe those aren't as important. So if you, if you 
put uh, numbers in front of these powers of the matrix to make them smaller as you go, you can get a convergent series, the matrix exponential, just using a little bit of calc one. Um, and that is a very important measure for people who work in graph theory. That's one form of uh, network centrality. Uh, so nodes, for example, along the diagonal of that matrix that have a high number are very central nodes in the network. Um, so if you had a network of communications between suspected terrorists, for example, uh, a large entry on the diagonal of that matrix is a guy you want to target a predator to go after, right? That's, that's exactly <laughs> what is being done. It sounds scary, but um, they do it. But the problem is, is that can be expensive to compute. Um, or, or if you're looking at the Bitcoin graph, which I'll get to in a minute, it can tell you important nodes in the Bitcoin. They're anonymous. You don't know who or what they are, but at least you know their uh, blockchain IDs, and then you can try and use other tools to try and figure out who those important nodes are and ignore the other ones. Um, so there were some guys uh, two years ago that wrote some just shockingly uh, important papers in uh, network analysis that show that the top K most important nodes of a network that are measured using a technique similar to this or exactly like that uh, can be computed. Those nodes actually live in a small, low rank subspace uh, uh, that, that is easy to compute. So in other words, uh, uh, there was an important paper a few years ago that showed that, those, that that's an easy problem. So on, this is a Chromebook. It's a pretty cheesy computer. And I can compute the network centrality for the entire Bitcoin network, uh, all 20 million uh, nodes in the network, in under two minutes on that you know, cheesy computer using this, this technique. And that shows me the most important blockchains addresses on, on the entire Bitcoin transaction graph. Uh, and I computed the five most central nodes in the network. So only up to, I, only, I said I'm only interested in the top five most important Bitcoin uh, addresses, show me who they are, and on a, even on a Chromebook you can compute this problem. Uh, to compare with a traditional method, um, I took a tiny subset of the, I can't even read that, a tiny subset of the Bitcoin matrix, a thousand by thousand leading sub-matrix for, for the Bitcoin graph, and I computed it using R's, so R has a built-in matrix exponential function called EXPM, which is uh, extremely carefully written, like almost everything in R. It's a very carefully written, you know, first world-class uh, implementation of Pade approximation to compute the matrix exponential. So we're comparing it against the gold standard. Um, and on, to compute this 1,000 by 1,000 uh, centrality of the Bitcoin network on that computer, using the traditional method, uh, takes 151 seconds. Um, and then using, computing exactly the same thing. And you, you can't see it, but the output is identical between these two methods. Um, computing the exact same thing using this alternative technique, which is a couple years old, um, takes a half a second. So we, we go from 115, 151 seconds to half a second, just by changing the math, but we're computing exactly the same quantity. Um, so again, uh, I actually was talking to some uh, people in finance who were actually doing some work with Bitcoin, and, and they were trying to parallelize algorithms to do that stuff, and I'm like, no, just, just use the right algorithm. <laughs> so getting back to Spark and kind of my axe to grind with Spark and Hadoop. Um, so there's a thing for Spark called Adam, A-D-A-M, uh, and it's the Spark genomics package, just like there's a graph package uh, for Spark, there's a genomics package for Spark, uh, and uh, Google pushes it uh, big time, uh, as well as the Berkeley guys who are into Spark. And I mean, it's just crap, really. I mean, I wouldn't use it if I were a bioinformaticist. Um, so here's an example um, to compute a principal components uh, from the National Institutes of Health uh, Thousand Genomes Project for, I just picked a single chromosome, a small one, chromosome 20. But it, it, that is almost irrelevant, it, it doesn't matter if it was the whole genome or just a couple of chromosomes or what, the conclusion would be the same. So this, this example is not mine. The Google guys have a YouTube video where they're saying how great uh, Google Genomics uh, and Spark is, and they, they say it's only 15 minutes to compute this on this giant Google cluster, right? This is, this is Google. There, this is a YouTube video. You can watch this guy hand-waving his way through uh, this principal component talk. <laughs> 
And you know, and I'm not saying that like computing principal components of a chromosome is is profound. All I'm saying is that it's easy, you know. And that's what the Google guys are missing. Um, so here's the entire R code from start to finish to do this. That's all you need. Now I'm cheating a little bit. I wrote a little C program to parse the NIH data set, the text file, uh, because it's a really weird text file format and it's hard to read. You could read it just in R, but it would be slower. So um, that program, just to read in the data, I wrote in C. This is all on GitHub, um, and I have a link to it at the end. And this reads the, the text file for chromosome 20 into a sparse matrix in R that's uh, got uh, 2,500 rows, because there's 2,500 people in the 1,000 Genomes Project. Um, and 1.8 million columns. That's how many variations along the genome exist on chromosome 20 for those 2,500 people. And then we load in a package to do an efficient principal component uh, computation. Um, this is the IRLBA package. It's probably the package I'm most well known for. Uh, it's a very, it's really if you need to do a large scale principal component or SVD, it's the only game in town uh, in either R or Python. Um, and then we plot the results. So I, I plot the result with a HTML widget, and this you can barely see. But so here's a 3D plot of the first three principal components of the chromosome 20 uh, for the 2,500 people uh, in the Thousand Genomes Project. And you can see there's some obvious clusters going on here, right? There's at least four main clusters, and then there's this kind of smear in the middle. And if we color those by uh, <laughs> ethnicity, it's pretty shocking. We pick, I mean, well, it's not that shocking. It's really not profound. The genes can pick out ethnicities, right? That's, in, a way, in a sense, it's almost obvious, actually, right? But so we, we get clusters for East Asians, South Asians, uh, Africans, Europeans, and non-European Americans, or the, the, the green kind of thing in the middle there. Um, so, this is something that uh, on a Chromebook, sorry, on a MacBook Pro takes from start to finish about two minutes using R. Two minutes. On a MacBook Pro, right, it's easy, in other words. This is not a big deal. It's a very simple problem. So if you hear somebody like Google spouting off how great they are, or Spark, just say, well, I can just do that with R. I don't need your fancy cluster or anything like that. Um, and I'll skip this in the interest of time. There's a, there's a really beautiful paper by some guys at Microsoft Research and gals at Microsoft Research that was in Nature recently for fast uh, linear mixed effects models, which uh, I'm very keenly interested in. And in fact, I'll be working with Microsoft on for uh, cleaning up an R package for them uh, in the fall. Um, so finally, uh, just to leave you with something practical, um, uh, the theme behind the every example uh, that we've seen. They're just a bunch of anecdotes, but there's, an, there's a thread that is common to all of them, and it's that uh, projection methods, like principal components and other projection methods, they turn big data into, into just data, right? That, so they're your friend, right? When, whenever you can use a projection method, even if it's not appropriate to use a projection method, you should try it anyway, because you may find it will work. Um, and then, what else do I say? 